Well, those cabinet picks are not the only indication of what the economy under President Trump might look like. Last night, air conditioning company Carrier announced it had reached a deal with the president-elect to keep 1,000 jobs in Indianapolis, jobs the company had planned famously to move to Mexico. Here to assess all this, what it means, what it might mean going forward, Steve Moore, Trump economic advisor, and Robert Reich, former Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton and author of Saving Capitalism for the Many, Not the Few. Thanks both for joining us. So, Robert Reich, I, I, I'm sure you have many criticisms of the Trump economic plan, but you must concede keeping American jobs in this country, something you've been for for many years, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great thing, Tucker. I think 1,000 jobs uh, staying in, in, in Indiana instead of going to Mexico uh, is a, a step in the right direction. I, I just don't know how it, it, that squares with bringing on uh, Steve Mnuchin, Mnuchin from Wall Street, who has been spending the last 20 years uh, basically pushing companies uh, to outsource abroad. I mean, there, there's some inconsistency there, isn't there, Steve Moore? <laughs> well, well uh, Bob, you know, we're the ones who are going to save capitalism because it needs uh, saving. And, you you look at the uh, the whole economic program, Tucker, the, the tax reductions, the pro-America energy policy, the regulatory relief. I do think this is something that this is an agenda that's going to create potentially millions of jobs. But on this issue of carrier, you know, the issue really is, should the, is it, is it uh, correct for the president to intervene with a company to try to uh, s save jobs? And I say, why not? You know, why not? I, I think it was a good thing. I, look, but, but you're see, not going to save the economy there, one business and, at a time, and ask uh, you to Tucker, but I think it sets a, uh, a good example example that this president is very serious about bringing right. jobs back to the Tucker. industrial Midwest, which is but, something but, so much. Steve, I just ask, may I just ask on Steve question? Moore? No, hold on. I thought that was a fair yeah. question about Goldman Sachs. This is the third Treasury Secretary we've had in my lifetime of recent yeah. history. From Goldman, Trump didn't run a pro-Wall Street campaign. It's a little weird. You couldn't find someone who wasn't from Goldman to run Treasury? Well, look, I've, I've worked with Steve Mnuchin on the tax bill. I find him to be incredibly smart in terms of uh, public policy. He's a supply sider. He wants to cut tax rates. Um, I, I think he's a very good choice. Uh, now, look, okay. it is interesting how, you know, Goldman Sachs people seem to always uh, appear in both administrations. As you know, Bob, there were Goldman Sachs people. Uh, Robert Rubin was a Goldman Sachs guy. Oh, so, yes, yes. you know, is there something wrong with that? Well, it's, it's not that there's something wrong with Goldman Sachs per se, uh, but as I recall, uh, Donald Trump ran as uh, sort of a populist. He right. criticized Wall Street. He, he talked about uh, uh, not only draining the swamp, but also uh, how Wall Street had, had, had sort of created a lot of problems for American workers. And here he is bringing, doing just what every president does when it comes to a Treasury secretary. You turn to Wall Street, and a lot of them turn to Goldman Sachs. How can you justify that? Well, I well Bob, can, we, can I ask a question of you, though? So the, our, the American economy at this stage is heavily reliant on the finance sector. So it kind of makes sense in that way. How do you move our economy from a, basically a finance-based economy to something else and better? What's the answer? Uh, well, one, uh, Tucker, one step you take, and I hope that, that Donald Trump does do that, President-elect Trump, to be accurate, uh, and that is a major infrastructure program. Uh, that is, you, you use what government can do, uh, and you also uh, get rid of all of the tax breaks that Wall Street has, like the, the carried interest rule that, uh, that so many, uh, you know, mergers and, 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 and also hedge fund managers and all these other pay people have been using uh, and, and abusing for so many years. But Bob, uh, you know, Wall Street has extraordinary political Bob, influence. You cut the political influence of Wall Street. You don't put a Wall Streeter <laughs> in your Treasury Department. Bob, that's exactly what you just described is exactly what we're going to do. I mean, Tucker, we are going to cut the tax rates. We're going to get rid of a lot of the uh, special interest deductions and, and uh, carve outs in the tax system for particular companies. We're not going to, by the way, we're not going to uh, have the government build 500 million uh, solar panels as Hillary Clinton wanted to do. We do want us to take the special interests out of the tax code, gr greatly simplify it. That's something you and I, I think, should, should agree on because I want to drain the swamp and so do you. Well, of course, but so, Bob, the, the carried interest loophole, which nobody really defends in public because it's right. impossible to defend. We get rid of that, by the way. We is get rid there of the because Chuck Schumer Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, Steve Moore, you say you get rid of it, uh, you got rid of it. You haven't even been, I mean, Donald Trump hasn't even come to office. Yeah, He's already it's, it's, filling it's, his administration it's in the plan. It is. With, 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 with Wall Streeters, with billionaires. <laughs> I mean, I don't understand how you can say that the Wall Streeters and the billionaires are going to, uh, they're going to 
make the tax code simpler and get rid of all the benefits for all the all the tax benefits for all the wealthy people. I mean, I'll, it doesn't I'll, stand a reason, does let it? Let me answer the question. We're going to take away all those special interest breaks. <laughs> and by the way, it is it is a centerpiece to uh, to Donald Trump's tax plan that the carry interest provision is gone. You should applaud that. And and he's made a big deal. Remember, Tucker, he made a big deal out of that in, in two of the three debates that the carried interest, a uh, special interest loophole is gone. So again, I don't understand why I would think Bob Rice would be on, on our agenda. I think you'd like what we're talking about. Well, I like getting rid of that carried interest loophole. I really do. I Why think is that, it still that's, there? That's no, one, no one has ever explained to me how after eight years of Obama, who's supposed yeah, to be on exactly. the side of the little guy, that is still there and Democrats aren't throwing a fit about it. I never have understood that. Tucker, I think they should, and uh, a lot of Democrats have. A lot of Republicans and Democrats both uh, go to the same trough. When it comes to campaigns, that trough yeah. is Wall Street. That's why it bothers me, frankly, that we've got another major Wall Streeter right there at the Treasury Department. <laughs> well, for also, Street, I mean, when, you talk about, when you talk about things that didn't get done, you talked about infrastructure. About, we, you know, one of the things we need in terms of infrastructure is pipelines. And, and uh, Donald right. Trump has said in his first 100 days, we're going to start rebuilding the Keystone Pipeline and another network of of pipelines around this country. And by the way, that's not going to cost the taxpayer a Steve, penny. Steve, that's a little so tiny part that? of infrastructure. Do you that infrastructure? Oh, it's so awesome. We're, we're talking about, we're we're talking about time, highways sorry, and we're talking about yeah, all but, the piping in America. But also uh, we're talking about all the sorts of infrastructure yeah. we need. Well, we, we're going to do Thank that too. But there's a lot of infrastructure that wasn't built under Barack Obama that needs to be built uh, under Donald Trump. And, and look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use that money. We're going to have to wait until tomorrow to find out what you're going to do. Build infrastructure. Email me. Steve, Bob, thanks a lot for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks. We're about to have a new president of the United States, which is always an exciting uh, subject for journalists because no matter what you cover, any area of policy around the world, in the United States, in the cities, farmland, you name it, you get to write about what you think the impact will be of the new administration. And yet there's a striking tone to many of the stories as President-elect Trump uh, starts to round out his cabinet, which is the low no Secretary of State, of course, uh, but some of his picks uh, reflect his views during the campaign. And yet, again, underlying tone of all this is that somehow these new appointees will be terrible for the country. So take, for example, HHS. Georgia Congressman Tom Price uh, is the pick there. He will probably be confirmed. And just one headline among many, I saw this one in Business Insider, Trump's new cabinet pick wants to destroy Obamacare. Cue the scary music. Now, whether you think Obamacare is good, bad, should be abolished, should be improved, how many times during the campaign did candidate Trump say he wanted to repeal and replace Obamacare? So, of course, he's going to pick a health care chief who has that view. And, in fact, uh, Tom Price has a rather detailed proposal for uh, an alternative health care system that you can pick apart, you can agree with, disagree with, but he's not just one of these guys who says, let's throw it out and not replace it with anything. And if you go down the list of appointees, you see this time and time again. Jeff Sessions at the Justice Department, uh, a lot of stories quoting Obama administration people saying, you know, he would trash civil rights enforcement. Well, it's certainly fair to say he will take a different approach to civil rights enforcement. Uh, same thing with the new Treasury Secretary appointee, Steve Mnuchin, former Goldman Sachs guy. Uh, Huffington Post had a screaming headline, Trump puts housing predator at Treasury. Why? Because Mnuchin once owned a hedge fund, which bought a failing bank, which had made a lot of these bad loans to homeowners and then started foreclosing on them. And so the, the main thing here, Education Department, Betsy DeVos, same thing, outspoken advocate of charter schools and school vouchers. So she's being portrayed in part by the teachers unions and by journalists sympathetic to the teachers unions as being anti-public school. Here's the thing. Elections have consequences. The reason we vote for president is not just to put a commander in chief in the Oval Office with all of that implies, but that person is going to pick department heads, agency heads. It's going to affect every corner of American life, regulations. And in Republican administrations, and I went through this in writing about the Reagan administration and the George W. Bush administration, a lot of these jobs tend to go to people who are from the business world, who have been regulated by some of these agencies, who don't necessarily like it, who have strong opinions about how things should be changed. In Democratic administrations, and we saw this with Clinton and Obama, uh, the picks tend to be people with long government experience or who are from advocacy, group, advocacy groups that want more spending or more aggressive government approach to problems of health, uh, urban decay, um, poverty taxes, you name it. 
Again, that's why we have elections. When President Obama took over, uh, a lot of the people that he named to these jobs, Eric Holder at Justice, and, all, and you can go down the list, they made very clear that they were going to try to reverse the policies of George W. Bush. And that was reported at the time, but not with this note of alarm and fear. And for those who think that Trump's appointees are going to do a bad job or are going to slash these programs, um, they need to keep in mind that that is they would be carrying out the wishes of their boss. And look, it's all too easy when you have programs. Let's take again take health care. So a lot of news organizations went and interviewed people who got insurance under Obamacare. And the program has, has done a lot to extend insurance. People who did not have it or could not afford it. It's also um, jacked up premiums and, and caused some people to lose their coverage. So it's been a very mixed record at best. And they all say, gee, I'm really worried that I'm going to lose my policy uh, under the new administration. But in other words, when you do that, you're always going to people who might potentially be hurt. And that's fair. It's part of the story. But too many times there is an underlying journalistic tone of this is terrible, this is going to hurt people, rather than, um, you know, not every government program is great, not every government program is well run, and not every problem deserves a government solution. So keep that in mind as we have the confirmation hearings and as some of these people take office. Uh, yes, they're going to shake things up. That's what Trump ran on. He wanted to drain the swamp. He's picking a lot of seasoned establishment types, but he wants to drain the swamp. Let's have that debate. It's a great debate. But let's be even-minded, let's be fair-minded about it, that this is what the new president said he was going to do if he got to Washington. Okay. Finally, the factor tip of the day. Eating large with Donald Trump. You might have seen this overexposed video showing the president-elect, Mitt Romney, and top Trump advisor Rents Previtz dining last night at Jean George inside the Trump Hotel here in New York City. Very chic. So here's what the guys had young garlic soup, I guess, as opposed to middle aged garlic soup. Sauteed frog's leg. Sorry, Kermit. Diver scallops with a caper raisin emulsion. I don't know what that is. Then the entree arrived. Trump and previous had prime rib. I do know what prime rib is. Romney had lamb chops with a mushroom bolognese sauce. All three had chocolate cake for dessert. Tab, more than 700 bucks, not counting drinks, tax, and tips. So you're in for more than a grand. Here's the factor tip of the day. Eating well is good. I just hope we're not paying for that. And welcome back to Hannity, Vice President-elect Mike Pence. He was on Capitol Hill earlier today holding meetings with Senator Mitch McConnell and Speaker of the House Paul Ryan. The Trump transition team remains hard at work filling key positions. We continue now with Newt Gingrich. You actually had a really good piece that was on FoxNews.com where you described President-elect Trump's three greatest challenges. Tell us what you think they are. Well, let me just say this. This came both from my own experience and being the Speaker of the House, and it came from my experience working with Reagan in 1980. The biggest challenge is to recognize that this is now a time of really dramatic change, and that he has to focus on the things that really matter that make the change. The city of Washington is going to rush up to him and say, oh, be reasonable. Well, being reasonable in Washington means selling out. And you'll remember this from the night you were with us in 1994, when all of our key supporters said about 2 o'clock in the morning, Please don't go to Washington and sell out. So the first thing is, you got to remember what you campaigned on, why you won, and you got to stick with it. He has a contract with the American voters. He has a new deal for African Americans. Uh, the Washington Post actually did a pretty good job of printing over 200 specific campaign promises. He needs to just check them off and not be reasonable, but insist that Washington change. Second, he cannot allow the urgent to drive out the important. He's got to get up every morning and remember, what is he trying to accomplish? <clears throat> How is he going to get it done? Because lots of little things will crowd in every day. They'll try to take away his energy and his time. It'll be even worse for his staff and his cabinet and others. So he's got to come back to the big things. He's got to stay focused on those things and, and not get off on other things. And finally, it's very important for him to figure out three to five things, no more that are the key to his presidency, the things he wants to be measured on in 2020. And he has to come up every morning and say to himself, these are the things I'm going to make sure happen. Economic growth is clearly one of them. Dealing with the southern border is one. 
fixing the health system has to be one. But you can't have more than about five big things uh, and stay focused on them. That was the key to Reagan's success. So about five things. But you hear the Washington Post actually printed out what they have, the 282 thing promises of Donald Trump. They got it right there. A lot of them are overlapping, obviously. You, you tell the story that when you became speaker, three days later you went to the Heritage Foundation and you said these words, I will uh, cooperate, but I won't compromise. You said reasonableness will be the death of Trumpism. Explain that. Right. Well, Chuck Schumer's going to come in and say, let's be reasonable. I'll pass a bill you like as long as it's totally acceptable to Democrats and the public employee unions and liberals. But we can be reasonable. What that means is, why don't you give up everything you campaigned on, give up everything you promised the American people, and I'll be for you. And if Trump says, you know, I'm going to stick with what I believe in, what I campaigned on, what I got elected for, they will immediately scream, starting with the Washington Post and the New York Times, they will scream, he's being unreasonable. Uh, and I think that's why uh, something you and I agree on totally, they should rethink from the ground up the whole concept of the White House press corps, come up with a totally new grassroots model, and not allow the traditional media to dominate and define White House press coverage. Let's talk about the rules of the Senate, because if any legislation is going to be stopped, it's going to be in the Senate. And we know that Harry Reid set a precedent, getting rid of the, using the nuclear option. And I think some Republicans are hesitant to do it themselves. But if things get stuck, for example, if Trump wants to really fix the economy, his plan's got to pass, and it's multifaceted. Energy independence is a big component. Eliminating Obamacare is a big component. A 15% corporate tax rate is a big component. Seven brackets to three is a big component. Repatriation money is a big component. Those are all big parts of what would be a recovery plan for the country. But let's say they try to filibuster. What does he do? Well, you go to the country. Uh, there's, there's a great book called The Education of Ronald Reagan, which I recommend everybody by Tom Evans. It talks about how Reagan learned at General Electric how to communicate with people, how to move popular opinion. And his theory was that he would shine the light on the country and then the American people would turn up the heat on Congress. There are 23 Democratic senators up for re-election in 2018. Now, we should be able to find six to eight of those senators who simply can't afford to vote no every day. And we should drive home again and again that we're either going to beat you or you're going to vote with us. And I think you start with things like reforming the Veterans Administration, having a tax cut for economic growth, and you, and you win. But I'd be very cautious about radically changing the Senate. I think I'm close to Mitch McConnell on this for this reason. Every time Obama did something that was totally partisan, the stimulus, Obamacare, it backfired because totally partisan bills aren't very well thought out. Uh, the There's only... a virtue to the legislative process. Okay, a virtue, but I worry about one issue that they've talked about. I, and by the way, I do believe we need to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, but they're talking about a, a trillion right. dollar price tag. I don't hear pay as you go, although they have talked a lot about the penny plan, which I support. Is this, and here's the other problem. When we spent money on the stimulus, it was misappropriated. It went through the bureaucracy. It didn't end up getting to sure. where it needed to go. Is well, there a way to pay for this as you go? Should there be a commission to sure. discuss um, how to distribute those funds? A trillion dollars is a lot of money. Look, I'm, I'm very excited about this. And on, on December 13th, I'm going to give a speech uh, at the Heritage Foundation on the principles of Trumpism. And this is one of the key areas. If we do a fundamental overhaul of how we do infrastructure, applying the lessons, for example, of the Woolman Skating Rink in Central Park, of the Ferry Point Golf Course that Trump built in, in the Bronx, where he literally took enormous amounts of cost out of the system. If we apply those kind of principles, we can build a huge infrastructure very inexpensively. If we apply the principles that Mitch Daniel used, that John Kasich used, uh, that, that others have used among Republican governors, we can cut 30, 40, 50 percent out of the cost of infrastructure. If we then open up federal lands for, for minerals, open up federal lands for energy, we can generate over a 10-year period a huge amount of money that will enable us to actually pay for this. So you could put together a paid-for infrastructure program, but that requires a new approach 
-hmm. requires giving up the baloney that Washington is dominated by and actually applying the principles be part Donald of the Trump deal. has applied in his own life. In other words, Democrats always want sure. money. They always want to spend it. But, if, for example, you always get the tax increase. Uh, you never get the tax cut. You always get promises of... of right. Uh, you, know, you, you always get the government that's spending. Why you, that's why you can't... Yeah. That's why you can't be reasonable. That's why you got to come in and say, I'm prepared to give the Democratic mayor's infrastructure if they're prepared to give us the ability to open up federal yep. land for, for oil and gas and, and, and minerals. Now suddenly you got a package. Now, I think a lot of the mayors are going to say, you know, I really need my roads. I really need my water system taken yep. care of. When you look at how bad the Flint, Michigan water system Horrible. is, it's clear we have to have a substantial infrastructure program. But then you cut through the red tape. Yeah. And you apply the principles of Trump, and now you've got a very dynamic, exciting program. All right, that that's a that's a big challenge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate. It. Well, we were told by the left for, I don't know, a year and a half that Trump was racist. That's the one thing you knew about him. He's racist. And not a single non-white voter would ever support him because that would be insane. But it turns out that Trump had more than double the support from African-American voters than Mitt Romney did in 2012. Not a ton, but double. How did he pull that off? Here now is one of those voters, Justin McClinton, who wrote a really interesting and nice piece on that recently. I think of the Federalist. Justin, it's great to see you tonight. Why did you vote for Donald Trump? Uh, so the main reason I decided to uh, vote for Donald Trump was, was really mostly based on policy. You know, I, I kind of zoned out the media. I kind of quickly realized that, hey, we're in an echo chamber. People are saying some pretty ridiculous stuff. So I said, where are the tomes? Where can I really get the information about each candidate's policy? So I just I, I went to the websites. And uh, I liked the things that I read on Donald Trump's website a bit better than on Hillary's. So what did you like? I mean, what, what jumped out at you? Uh, so what jumped out at me in particular was uh, Trump's policies on e education and particularly being in favor of uh, school choice. So, you know, the first thing that, uh, you know, comes up under that uh, particular part of the site is him talking about how he's going to, you know, support the school choice effort. I uh, worked yeah. in a charter school my myself on the south side of Ooh. Chicago. And uh, while I didn't agree with everything they were doing, I, I really uh, thought they were doing some, you know, some other good things for the for the students. So, you know, that was really my, my biggest thing, uh, you know, that charter school support. And I think Betsy DeVos is going to be, a, you know, a pretty good education secretary. And I'm hoping she, you know, they continue to go along that, uh, those lines. What's so interesting is if you look, just to get onto the school choice question for a second, if you look at support among African Americans for school choice, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's over 75% in the last poll that I saw. And yet the NAACP, which reports to speak for all African Americans, recently came out against it. There seems to be a massive disconnect between African American voters and their purported leaders on that question. Why? Yeah, it's, a, it's unfortunate that you see that kind of dis disconnect between the organizations, and I don't, I don't know what kind of goes on at the head. I mean, there was actually a, a prominent Black Lives Matter leader in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, I want to say, who, prior to joining the organization, he was actually, uh, he worked in education, and he had noticed that in his community in particular that the charter schools had, uh, you know, they had been doing some really good things for the, for the, for the youth, and, you know, for that, he, he had to uh, kind of distance himself from the organization, and it's unfortunate, but, yeah. you know, those organizations don't always represent everyone's opinion, and you know, so support. agree or not on, on school choice or any of the other slate of issues, you're looking at this in terms of what Trump is saying he will do rather than through the lens of identity politics. And that makes you very different from most voters your age, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, for me, it's it's about American issues and, and the issues that I believe in in particular. And I, you know, I try to vote with my my head, and and I'm you know just just try to be informed about things. And like I said, I, I like the policies that that I saw on the website. So you had this really interesting. I'm not exactly sure what this means, but you had this really interesting line in your piece that jumped out at me. You said you went to a majority black high school and a majority black college, and then you wound up at a college that was majority white, and you said that was the really politically intense and troubling experience to you. And you said a quote. A great benefit of racial homogeneity is allowing for students to pursue educational goals unimpeded by identity politics. What does that mean exactly? 
Um, you know, so I, you know, while I was uh, at Morehouse, uh, the really intelligent young women at uh, Spelman would often, you know, kind of challenge me on certain positions just when we were having debates on campus. But you know, you could have a debate without feeling, you know, pressured not to hide your, your true opinions. And right. you know, and at the schools, you know, we, it was really just a big focus on, hey, get you know, getting your work done and making sure you're, you're you know learning and getting everything you're supposed to get from a college environment. Well, I feel like you know, at, at the graduate school I attend, which is a pretty large university in California, you know, there's there's just a lot of fear and uh, people, uh, you know, they can't, it feels like they can't have those those conversations that I thought were so influential and crucial to my college experience. And, you know, it right. kind of saddens me a little bit that, you know, they, uh, you know, they had some Trump chalkings and that that's kind of seen as, you know, a bit of an attack. And it's like, it's something, you know, for me, I kind of see it like, hey, if people could have open conversations about why they might, you know, be interested in voting for Trump or why they, they like some of his policies, then maybe we wouldn't have this kind of back and forth where it feels like it's, you know, people attacking each other and causing all this exactly. discomfort. So if you're a member of the group, you're, you're assumed to be supporting a specific party line, and if you don't, you're attacked. We've seen this before. Justin, thanks a lot for joining us. That was really interesting. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Tucker. Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Big win for Donald Trump. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. As we've stated, Mr. Trump won the election because of his economic vision. He promised to stop American corporations from sending blue-collar jobs overseas. Companies like Carrier are firing their workers and moving to Mexico. Ford is moving all of their small car production to Mexico. When I'm president, if a company wants to fire their workers and leave for Mexico or other countries, then we will charge them a 35 percent tax when they want to ship their products back into the United States. And they won't leave, believe me. Well, now the Carrier Corporation says it will stay in Indianapolis, saving 1,000 jobs. No question, President-elect Trump, using Vice President-elect Mike Pence, put the arm on Carrier. The president can do a lot of damage if he or she chooses to. Carrier wised up fast, and the folks know Trump is the reason. I would like to tell him thank you for... Uh going out of your way and taking your uh, holiday uh, away from your family and uh, working on the carrier and employees deal and uh, sticking to your word and going to bat for all of us at carrier. Now, if Mr. Trump continues to fulfill promises, he will gain much needed support in Congress. Right now, no Republican would dare defy Trump after a victory like carrier. In the long run, there are two things that Donald Trump needs to do to achieve a successful presidency. The first is to foster an environment where good paying jobs are created in the USA. And the second is to stop the chaotic enforcement of immigration law, which by extension protects us from terrorism. Now, it's quite clear to talking points that the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton put the needs of immigrants, the needs of immigrants, some of them here illegally, above the needs of working folks. For the past eight years, President Obama has encouraged illegal alien amnesty for certain groups, sanctuary cities, and a colossal welfare state. Meanwhile, the folks out in Indiana and other places are being laid off because corporations want to make a few extra bucks by moving to Mexico or another foreign country. Trump said enough. Thus, he won the election. Summing up, Donald Trump off to a good start with the carrier deal. He might, though, adopt a new motto with a nod to Teddy Roosevelt. Tweet softly, but carry a big stick. And that's a memo. Now for the top story reaction. Joining us from Miami, Bernard Goldberg. You're not a big Trump guy, or at least you weren't. Are you modifying your opinion a bit? You know, when people say, I'm glad you asked me that question, I am really glad you asked me that question. It's not so much that I don't think you get it, but I want to make this statement to the most loyal Trump supporters. I'm not an ideologue, okay? Uh, when Donald Trump lied during the campaign, when he was vindictive during the campaign, when he mocked people who didn't deserve it, I pointed that out. And if he does it again when he's president, I will continue to point it out. And when he does something good, as he did in Indiana, when he saved 1,000 jobs that belong to real people who won't be out in the street, 
I am gladly, gladly congratulating okay, him for doing that. Okay, but it's more that. than that. And, and let me, let me uh, frame the question this way. If Hillary Clinton had won the election, Kerry would be going to Mexico, right? Would you agree? That's right. Okay. That's Hillary absolutely. Clinton doesn't give a uh, bunny's butt uh, about jobs going out of this country. I can't even remember her even addressing the issue. So what Trump promised, he, at least this time, fulfilled. So that, therefore, absolutely. as a politician, not a guy, not a tweeter, not a, not a businessman, but as a politician right now, you have to say his status is, is moving up. Is it not? Absol absolutely. It, it, let, let's look at what he did that Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama or Bernie Sanders probably couldn't do. If Barack Obama or if Hillary Clinton had won or if Bernie Sanders had won, went to an American corporation and said, you're not leaving this country. Conservatives on talk radio and some on this channel would have been all over Obama or Clinton or Sanders saying, you can't tell a private company oh, I don't know what about they can that. do. Not but, in this economic climate. Well, hold climate. on, hold mm -hmm. on. But just, but I don't think they would say, I, I think conservatives would have attacked Barack Obama. That's what I think. But just as uh, Nixon was the one who opened the door to China, if McGovern had won in 1992, uh, 1992, not 1990, no, 1972. Was, right, 72. He, he, could not, he could not have opened the door to China because conservatives would have said he's cozying up to a bunch of communists. So Donald Trump did what would have been, let's say, much more difficult for Barack Obama or Hillary but Clinton. But they do. wouldn't have had but the will it. to do but it. But he did That's it. That's my point. They he, wouldn't he, have had the, the left, would not have the will to do it. And, and that's the difference. Now, let me get on to something that we reported on on Monday. 75, 275 nuts, white power guys, show right. up in Washington. And the, who's there to greet them? 50, 5 0 journalists, right. most, most of them national people. 275, right. 50. Farrakhan, and we used a clip of him, routinely goes out and talks right. to thousands of people. All right? Nobody shows up. Same kind of crazy rhetoric. Same thing, just a different color scheme. Can you explain that to me? I, I think I can. I think I can. Journalists are attracted to stories that conform to their own preconceived notions or biases. So if they think, and a, and a lot of liberals both in the media and outside see America through a very dark lens, they think there's far more bigotry in this country than there actually is. So you have 275 idiots out there spouting off Hitler stuff, and you have, according to the Washington Post, 50 reporters. I that know. would be funny if it didn't tell you as much as it does about journalism. Phil, I have the latest FBI statistics on hate crimes from 2015. Only hate crimes involving race or ethnicity. In a country of 330 million people or thereabouts, there were 4,200 16 hate crimes. That's 4,216 too much, but it represents a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of 1%. But if journalists believe that this is a country that's yep. <clears throat> filled with racists, they will cover well, it. Well, it's also to idiots. make Trump look bad because they, this whole narrative that Trump's a white power guy, they, they love that narrative. I got to run. Bernie Goldberg, okay. everyone. Thank you, Rally. Later tonight, Cincinnati, Ohio, celebrating a stunning victory three weeks ago. But first, Mr. Trump goes to Indiana to highlight the deal with Carrier that could save a thousand American jobs. And Rich Edson leads our coverage. He's live in Indianapolis. And what do we know so far about the terms of this deal with Carrier, Rich? Now, good morning, Bill. And we don't know all that much. Carrier in February said it was going to move 1,400 jobs from this area, including this plant. It now says it's going to keep about a thousand. It acknowledges that the state of Indiana has agreed to an incentive packages, but we don't know the details of how much that's going to cost the state. Uh, the company does say, however, that it's the result of negotiations with the incoming Trump-Pence administration, and they have made it clear, according to the company, that they support the business community 
and to create an improved business environment. Trump and his allies say he is making good on a campaign pledge to negotiate a deal to keep companies like Carrier from moving jobs overseas and over to other countries. Also possibly at play here, Carrier is owned by United Technologies. They get about five to six billion dollars in government contracts and there is a move within Congress to punish companies that receive federal contracts and then move jobs overseas, Bill. So there are some who are critics of this deal. Uh, what are they saying, Rich? Uh, they are. They point out we're unclear how much this is going to cost the state of Indiana in this incentive package. Uh, also, it still doesn't change the fundamentals, they say, of the U.S. economy and what's causing companies to move jobs overseas. Even Carrier acknowledges it in its statement saying, quote, this agreement in no way diminishes our belief in the benefits of free trade and the forces of globalization will continue to require solutions for the long-term competitiveness of the U.S. and of American workers moving forward. Others question whether other companies will start to say they're going to move jobs overseas and get some sort of package in return from their state. States uh, and companies are doing that right now, even within the United States, when companies threaten to move to different states within the U.S. Uh, Bernie Sanders, senator who also ran for president of the Democratic Party, also says that uh, Trump was taken advantage of in this negotiation. So, but still, uh, folks here, workers here, are pretty excited. Uh, they say there could be a commitment of about a thousand jobs staying in the United States, Bill. Rich, thank you. Rich Edson on scene there in Indianapolis. Thank you, Rich. You know, our control room's kind of snarky today, and I don't like it. They are. Welcome to Outnumbered Overtime. Yeah. OT baby Brian Kilmeade is on the couch, and uh, we're having a little fun today. I realize there's a lot of responsibility on you two. <laughs> uh, you two in these seats, because you get a lot of instructions that we don't get. Yes. Right? I'm like, I see your eyes moving back and forth, and I go, either she's fascinated or she's got another We're show fascinated with you. You're always fun to have on the show. You were one of our originals. You've been on since week one, April 2014. Yes, I was originally Chuck from Happy Days. I was uh, the best <laughs> the, the older brother. The brother, yeah. Yeah, whatever happened Who was to him? Story? What happens I still is don't know. Ron Howard overshadowed him, and right. then Fonzie emerged, and you don't need Chuck the basketball player. And then yes. Chachi. Right. Yes. You know, Chachi was like the young Chachi. Fonzie. Fonzie, right. and then, you know, it's like, who needed What's Chuck? happening here? Single-handedly <laughs> responsible for uh, Donald Trump winning. Chachi? Yes. And don't, let's Chachi. not start with Joni Loves Chachi and Korea. Melissa please. is confused. Why? I, I just, I don't know how we got off on this binge. <laughs> you, you, we that's right, you, you were part of the and, pop no, no. culture TV landscape in the late 70s love, and early 80s. I totally forgot. Yeah. I love Oh, Brent. wait, except for the part where you were. And people can pre-order your book. <laughs> if actually was go. on that. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Um, but yeah, no, so good to have you here. Sorry, the last stop is where you've got one more. I'm going to be in Jacksonville book. December 9th. Okay. The thing that would happen with, uh, with Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. and the Tripoli Pirates, I thought it was going to be a great book. The surge had worked. I couldn't wait. I loved researching it, and I thought people who loved history would like it, and mm -hmm. Fox fans would get it. Mm -hmm. But what happened is the surge got undone. Mm -hmm. We pulled out. Out comes ISIS. In comes the Libya operation, mm -hmm. and people saw the analogy between Tripoli, which wow. was the capital, is the capital of Libya, and what was going on then, and how Jefferson handled it, and as opposed to Barack Obama and George Bush handled it. Wow. And what I think we're realizing now is you've got to go at our enemy directly. We're trying to rationalize and use our morals. It doesn't work no. because we have an immoral yeah. enemy who is d abusing their own Islamic people in the 1780s, and 1810, and 1815, and 1826, yep. and they're doing the same thing now. And sadly, the only thing they understand is direct pressure, and that's what we decided to do. Jefferson watched Washington and Adams to balk, mm -hmm. and he said, no, I, we got to fight these He's guys. He's like, numero tres, we're going to hit this one out of the park. Right, and he ended up doing that. We had our first land invasion in a foreign country, and that's where it plays to the military. And that's why the it's shores in, the, of Tripoli. in the Marine hymn. Yes, and our first yeah. Marines were the ones to take a, sta a, a standing city and to defeat a sitting army in Derna, right outside Tripoli. All right, John Kinsley says, congratulations on your book, at Brian Kilmeade. Uh, we're on Facebook Live right now. A lot of people weighing in. They loved the show. A lot of people talking about the Secretary of State going back to our A block, about a big decision yet for President-elect Trump to make, and a lot of people are getting anxious for him to do so, such as Megan. Yeah, I mean, I have the attention span of a hamster as well, so I'm at the point <laughs> where I'm sick of... You don't want him to? I do want it. I want him to, yeah. I mean, but don't you think it's interesting I how like, he, he's leaked all the names of Secretary of State candidates and then continues to fill the positions, and it's like the build-up on fight night. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the, the main card, and... Yeah. 
It's, I, I could stare at those doors on C-SPAN all day. <laughs> yeah. I, I They're really so do. golden. They are golden. Really are. Richie owns the building. Isn't that a spa, the golden door? It right. is, but I feel like it's less gold. Even the golden door is How less could it gold. possibly be more know. gold? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Pat's Mrs. Brian, love you. Come to Allentown, PA. I don't know if next he has any time. plans to do something uh, next, next year. Time. But it is, it is as I pass through Allentown on are one of my many a, soccer tournaments. Are you going to do a follow-up book? Um, I think my next book we're going to look at Andrew Jackson mm -hmm. and the and the and the and Battle of New Orleans. 14, took a little I think trip you should. Uh, uh, Andrew Jackson down the mighty Mississippi took a little bacon and we took a little beans. <laughs> nope, no one else learned that in sixth no, grade. But I'm enjoying it. <laughs> yes, that the songs and the voices are. There's two phenomenal. already. Yeah. yeah. We're whispering. How about 50 nifty United States and 13 original <gasps> colonies? Oh, that's the best. You know it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. It's my favorite. We got right. a shower curtain with the United States of America and all the capitals. Love and it. And my seven-year-old has memorized them. I'm very proud of her. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, you can be like, what's Washington State? And she's like, Olympia. Because she doesn't know how to say it, but she knows the word. Wow. How it's like, old? Nevada, Carson City. That's amazing. Yeah, it's great. So she just stares at it all day long. Pretty smart. She's in the shower all day long? Just in the shower, just right. staring at it. But I, I will say this. No matter how good uh, Kennedy's upbringing has been learning about world history, the B.A. McCain must be unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Is that something you learn right away out yes. of the womb about American history, about the military service? My your... entire childhood was spent going to Civil War memorials and World oh War gosh. II memorials. I have been to Midway, which is mid-May between Hawaii and mm -hmm. Japan, where the yeah. Battle of Midway raged. Got to tur turn 16 yeah. there. Is, All, is there. I mean, is there a, you have no is idea. Is it a tropical paradise mm -hmm. there? It's actually beautiful. Like, it do is, they have hotels? There's no hotel. No. You have to stay at an old military base that they... I don't know if we specially got to go because of my dad or if you can actually go there. I don't remember, but they do research on Goonie birds. Have you been to Vietnam? Kind of bird. I have been to Vietnam. How was I've that? Been to Germany. Uh, I went and saw, obviously, where my father was uh, imprisoned, and it was very emotional. It? Yeah, we all went together, which is very, it's sort of morbid, but I, I think it's important to see. I will someday take my children, and I've been to every war history in the United States and abroad. I spent my entire childhood doing it, and wow. I'm surrounded. Every man in my family is in the military. Do you want to hear so, something interesting? Got it covered. My uncle uh, was in the Navy, <laughs> and her grandfather was his admiral. Yeah. Is yeah. This, really? Did you just realize that you've already discussed this? We have discussed this, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, did you ever push back and say, listen, uh, Dad, yes. I want to hang out with my friends. I have my yes. prom tonight. Yes, I did, 100%, and it didn't. he did not care. I am grateful now, but when you were a teenager. Was yes. there ever pressure to join the military? No, no not for me, Did actually. you ever consider it? Uh, I did not consider joining the military. I was the one child that was always on his campaigns, and partly just because of my age uh, at the time, and I was taken out of school to work with him, so I always went through politics, but everybody else in the military... Well, so, uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook. Facebook is actively running and doing wonderfully. Uh, if you're trying to get us an outnumbered overtime on the web, uh, please keep trying to jump in. I'm sure it'll be up in no time. Thanks, Jay. Um, looking at Facebook, though, a lot of people um, still <coughs> talking about the picks. Are there any picks that you think are still going to come in that are going to be a big surprise, Brian Kilmeade? I think that I would not be surprised if it's not Mitt Romney and it's not uh, Senator Corker. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I would, what? would not. If it's you don't think it's going to be Corker? I hate to be go against Kennedy. I would say that there's an excellent shot that Bolton and Giuliani are going to get it. I really? think that he's going to be. I, I think, think Romney, still in it. Romney, to me, in yesterday, I don't think he's going to get the shaft. He's I think shaft. Romney, to me, is going to get an offer for a different position. Mm. Which I will be the shaft. If he's not Secretary of State, he was his most loyal of loyalists. I, no, I'll not Rudy. Not Rudy. I'm sorry about Romney. Oh, Romney. Romney oh, yes. will get yeah, another position. But you know, someone said put like, him. Maybe uh, Romney said apparently won't take another one. Yeah, that's no. what that, that was the scuttlebutt on that one. And people yeah. were reporting he's because his be dad said never take else. a position in somebody else's administration. But I think this might be a little bit different. The interesting historical reference too is that Mitt Romney's father worked for Nixon mm -hmm. and then ended up they leaving did. the Nixon administration because they had such a contentious relationship oh. and sort of went and joined for the good of the country. And it will be interesting to see if history in the Romney family also failed in his bid for the presidency. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes. Well, Sandra, what's happening over there? What show are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. There's something major going on over um, there. So every day we want to make sure everybody can log on to Outnumbered Overtime on the web. It's about 10,000 people that log on. Like, that's just the people who log on so they can comment. So there's a lot more. And, I mean, we've been hitting records lately. I just, for some reason, maybe it's my device that I can't see it at this moment. Um, but Facebook.com is active, and you can tweet us as well. So what happened? You asked a question. Well, why were you laughing?
I was laughing because we're going back and forth with the control room at what they can see versus what we can see here. Oh. And they've got x-ray vision and they can hey. see it anywhere. <laughs> so yeah. I was supposed That's to uh, have terrifying. Ambassador John Bolton on my show. What happened? I would love uh, to canceled? watch you debate him. We've, I would love we've, that. We've gone yeah. at it. He gets I very frustrated. It. Yeah, he, he, the interesting thing about John Bolton is like you, mm -hmm. I know you like to think that we're, we're worlds apart in many areas. <laughs> There's really only a few aspects and that would be uh, surveillance and hawkish foreign policy. The rest of it, Military I believe. Military spending too, right? Yeah, probably. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that you are in many respects a libertarian. I think you have very libertarian views outside of those two I things. Do. I do. John Bolton, aside from the fact that he wants to bomb uh, many countries, uh, he is very libertarian, and so we gave him a libertarian litmus test. Uh, oh, you know, kind of as a joke, he thinking that he would fail. He passed with flying colors. Right. You know, I mean, See, we're talking about. So you made up. It's fascinating. By the end of this, he yeah, I was. I, I was on his lap. He was very <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> I, was, I, I think you guys should do like an intelligent. Square debate. I actually love the idea of like a really hardcore libertarian and then a hardcore hawk debating each other and where they can meet in the middle. So yeah. he should not cancel your show. Oh no! I but he said he had that he never cancels Fox appearances. He's he's very very uh, committed to his job yes, as a contributor and he he doesn't cancel. But he said he had an emergency meeting. See, I knew which that's makes where you're going. me think oh, that's that where you're perhaps going. he is going to the mm -hmm. gilded doors yes. of Trump Tower and meeting once again. You know they aren't really gold. By right. the way, I, yeah, bet, they watching I bet they are along with those golden shovels that 14. he and his children use when they <laughs> break ground on a new project. Well, wow, there's Funny. so much reference. You have so much depth in your life and your references. I got to start doing more stuff. <laughs> I can't refer to anything that you can refer to. That's not true. Right. I never, I never I said to myself, I was about to say that, Kennedy. What? I never said, after you make a reference, I never said, I was about to say that. You're always, you pull <laughs> things out <laughs> from, from where I don't know. I would say this. What about Deputy Secretary of State? For John Bolton? Yeah. Not going to happen. Would it, would it, I've already been the so U.S. Either. ambassador to the U.N. I don't know why he would want that yeah. either. Oh, and I just got an outnumbered overtime into working. And now here comes the music. <laughs> thank you Where's for all your questions. Uh, we'll, we'll read them later. Brian Kilmeade, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Always good to have you. Here. And thanks, everybody. We'll see you at noon tomorrow.